Hello and welcome to The Pulse. According to a report released by the Census and Statistics Department last month, the richest households in Hong Kong earn around 44 times more than the poorest. The gap between the rich and poor is at a historic high. Hong Kong is home to 1.16 million elderly people, 2.6% more than five years ago. Almost a third of them are classified as poor elderly. Although they receive a small government payment of so-called fruit money, the struggles for survival is tough and an often uncaring bureaucracy is not making things easier. More on that in part two. But first, last Friday, in response to a legal action brought by the then chief executive, Lan Chung Ying, and Secretary for Justice, Rimsky Yoon, the High Court disqualified four pro-democracy legislators for the way they took their oaths of office. This with the earlier disqualification of Lan Chong Hang and Yao Wai Ching effectively invalidates some 180,000 votes cast for these pro-democratic politicians. While Chief Executive Carrie Lam may say she wants better relations with the pan-democrats in the legislature, last Friday's disqualification of another four pro-democracy lawmakers for their oath-taking has only hardened better lines. In his 112-page judgment, Justice Thomas Au said he had based his ruling on both common law principles and last year's interpretation of Article 104 of the Basic Law by the National People's Congress. Referring to that interpretation, Au stated that legislators must take the oath in exactly the same form and content, do it solemnly and sincerely, and sincerely believe in and strictly abide by the pledges in the oath. Some criticized the application of the MPC interpretation, not only delivered while the lawsuit was pending, but also given retrospective effect. Article 104 had not previously specified the manner and format of the oath-taking. It simply required one to swear to uphold the basic law and swear allegiance to the HKSAR of the People's Republic of China. One of the disqualified legislators, Leighton Law, later wrote that the retrospective application meant the oath we are taking today has violated the interpretation of a law tomorrow. The interpretation doesn't change anything at all. And it's certainly not something new, because what disqualifies you is Section 21 of the Oath and Declaration Ordinance. It's less than two lines, and which says that you will be disqualified if you fail or refuse to take the oath. And in the previous case, uh, the Hartman's case, uh, where long hair applied to court for judicial review, uh, also made it very plain that under the oath and uh, declaration ordinance, it says very clearly you need to read out what is stated in the annex which set out the oath which needed to be taken. And so you've got to read out that oath, not any other oath. I think even these four legislators um, may be able to foresee at the time they took the oath that uh, there might be some legal problems uh, with the oath. But the degree of the severity of the legal consequences of their taking the oath in this way was probably not foreseen at the time they took the oath. So the law about oath-taking was clarified subsequently by the NPCSC. I'm sure that if the NPCSC interpretation existed at the time the oath uh, was taken, uh, the uh, four legal members would probably not uh, have taken the oath in the manner in which they actually took it. So that is why I would suggest that in the present case, um, some kind of leniency should be considered for the four LegCo members, such as uh, LegCo not requiring them to, to pay back the salaries and allowances which they had already received. Mr. 
，通過個事後嘅釋法，隔硬剝奪咗我哋前後六個議席。嗱，而家我最後警告你，我只係企喺度抗議啫，咁都唔得。還我議員。The unseating of the six legislators and the effective invalidation of the 180,000 voters who elected them removes the power of the bloc to veto legislative changes by government and pro-Beijing lawmakers. It's only 29 days from the start of this present new administration. Uh, the honeymoon period is more, more or less over by now. Um, it's very sad to see the initiative taken by the new administration uh, frustrated in that sense, but unfortunately, that's the way it, um, Hong Kong has been, um, you know, experiencing for the last 20 years, if you like. So uh, hopefully, uh, something good might come out of this, but unfortunately, it might have to um, be there for a while before we can see some uh, light towards the end of the tunnel. 直選部分嘅嗰個分組點票咧，就已經不能夠再透過直選部分嘅大多數咧，係否決任何分組點票。咁最大嘅可能性就係話，即係如果建制派提出要修改立法會嘅議事規則嘅話咧，即係例如話，即係好多現在佢哋拉布嘅措施都不能夠再做嘅話咧，咁就會即係誒都幾大地影響咗依一個即係民主派可能抗爭可以用嘅方法嘅。咁其實會令到好多人質疑，即係基本上成個選舉嘅意義喺邊度？咁或者即係話誒選民嘅意願又去咗邊度咧？咁嗰個我相信都係會對成個即係立法會嘅選舉民選嘅制度咧，係造成一個好大嘅打擊嘅。Well, with me in the studio is Barrister Margaret Ng, and in fact, former legislator representing the legal constituency. Can I ask you the status of these these six? Legislators who've been disqualified. I mean, two of them are appealing. Is there any point in the other four appealing? Well, I don't think that their situation is fundamentally that different. It is uh, the question of how the interpretation of the NPCSC should be applied. Uh, and I think that unless these four, these letter four, uh, go on appeal, um, of course, the, the Court of Appeal is bound by its earlier judgment, so that would be just a step, a stepping stone, a question of going to the Court of Final Appeal. So I think that if they want to appeal, they would all have to end up in the Court of Final Appeal. One of the, the uh, uh, clearest points that you want to press is whether the, it, the application of this uh, interpretation has uh, a, a, what we call retrospective effect, that is, can you judge a past conduct with a new law? You change the law and you apply that to the legislators. Is that permissive, permitted by our law or not? I think that is the main point and the, the practical effect part of it. Now, we, we seem to be entering a sort of Wild West territory where anybody can challenge the results of an election um, by saying, oh, we don't think that person sincerely took the oath or, or what have you. I mean, is that in fact where we are? No, more or less. Um, now, I think the, the most recent judgment demonstrates that the interpretation pushed to its extreme end would make a mockery of the rule of law and would also make a mockery of the democratic process. Now, you're talking about the interpretations from the Standing Committee yes. of, uh, of the yeah. MPC. Are you expecting them to be throwing, uh, flowing thicker and faster? Unless there is a political price to pay, which they do not wish to pay, because immediately after the uh, uh, judgment in the earlier two cases, already China scholars are saying, oh, I see, this is a much better way of dealing with Hong Kong people because they trust the courts. And so doing it through the courts is a much better way and is more, more economical from their point of view, doesn't even have to go through LegCo. So I think that the, the, um, it has already been suggested that this is a more convenient, and effective and powerful way of doing things. So the, the only question is, is there anything else to balance it? Now, there is a, a pervasive feeling of dejection and despair that uh, uh, Beijing is not going to be worried by a few people protesting in Hong Kong. And once people get that idea, fewer and fewer people will, will, will protest. And so there'll be less and less of a part 
uh, of a price to pay on the other side. So the question is, can you change the reality? And that brings us to the question of whether the democratic camp should really be focusing on the courts to fight this, or in terms of general political campaigning. What's, what's your view on well, that? I don't think that you can ignore the courts or the legal procedure, but I think your major work must be with the community. If you have a totally demoralized community, then there is nothing on which you can, you can you know, there's no strength to your case at all. But if you, the community is with you, or if you can get the community to be with you, then I think if you believe in the rule of law, even if they didn't, then you will have to fight it in the courts, and you have to pay for it. And if the community is prepared to do that, then you have a chance. But if you say, we're not prepared to pay the price, then we might as well you know, just lie down and, and, and call it a day and forget politics. Margaret, and thank you very much indeed. And we'll be back after the break. See you then. Welcome back. According to Chief Executive Carrie Lam, subdivided flats is just to be regarded as a general term. After all, not all of them are illegal or contravening fire safety regulations or building regulations. Ms Lam's Transport and Housing Minister, Frank Chan, is even suggesting that the government could get in on the act by building and renting subdivided flats as a temporary solution to the housing problem. If it's hard for young working people to keep a roof over their heads, spare a thought for Hong Kong's elderly, a third of whom are officially classified as living in poverty. Some try to do a little manual work to survive, but a sometimes hostile government bureaucracy only adds to their problems. In a society that claims to respect its elders, the real picture is hardly one of respect. In mid-June, a 75-year-old lady who collects cardboard to supplement her income was arrested by six Food and Environmental Hygiene Department officers for selling one piece to a Filipina domestic helper in Central for one dollar. The incident sparked a public outcry. More than a thousand people signed an online petition urging the department to drop the charge. A week later, after consulting the Department of Justice and considering the old lady's background, the FDHD did so. That case seems to be settled, but it once again drew attention to the plight of the elderly who need to collect rare views to survive. According to the Society for Community Organization, there are approximately 5,000 scavengers around Hong Kong. Some are homeless. Sister Wong has no savings, no home and no family support. Now 65, she keeps herself alive with her old age allowance of around $2,500 and the less than $1,000 a month she earns selling cardboard to recyclers in the new territories. Her total income is below the poverty line of $3,800. To Sister Wong, money is not the only concern, given that she's trying to survive in a community that looks down on her. Managers of nearby shopping malls try to prohibit their tenants from giving her any boxes. Even though her poor health precludes labor-intensive work, 
she has tried applying for a cleaning job in a fast food shop. She was turned down. Leg pains, a curved spine and a weak heart means she cannot move quickly. That makes her an easy target for thieves. As a street sleeper, Sister Wong sometimes gets her goods and possessions confiscated by FEHD officers. She says they take away not only her cardboard, but also personal belongings like food and clothes donated by people in her neighborhood. We asked the department to provide its guidelines on confiscating the possessions of the needy. It declined to comment on individual cases and requested more detailed information on Sister Wong before answering us. At her request, we preserved her anonymity. There have been several controversies over the FEHD's enforcement policy when it comes to disadvantaged and elderly people. Last October, a street cleaner was given a fixed penalty ticket after pouring water on a street in Wan Chai. She said it was clean. The officer insisted it was dirty. Two weeks later, the department dropped the charge. We talked by phone to a frontline officer who has worked on an FEHD hawker control team for 22 years. He told us they certainly had legal grounds to prosecute the $1 cardboard granny and there is no clear guideline on when they can use discretion. Last week, legislators discussed the hawker control team's enforcement strategy during the meeting of LegCo's panel on food safety and environmental hygiene. Some criticized the teams for picking on the weak and elderly. They also questioned whether frontline officers had to chase a quota of prosecutions to get satisfactory appraisals. But the problem of the poor elderly goes way beyond improving hawker control strategy. Some legislators are still fighting for more comprehensive elderly policies, in particular a universal retirement protection scheme. We fight on a policy level for universal retirement protection scheme. We also fight for uh, better benefits for them, uh, medical care, uh, housing, uh, and other types of support for the elderly population in Hong Kong.
It's just over a week since the death of Nobel laureate and activist Liu Xiaobo. His body was cremated just three days later, his ashes scattered in the sea. The government says his wife, Liu Xia, and his friends are free to move as they wish, but they're being kept incommunicado. News of his death and responses to it is tightly censored across the mainland. The apparent aim of scattering the ashes at sea was to avoid creating any site for his supporters to gather in tribute. It may have backfired. The sea makes up two-thirds of the world's surface and people in China and elsewhere are turning there to pay their respects. We'll leave you with images of the commemoration in Hong Kong and that of Liu's friends in Beijing. Good night. Thank you.